Let's begin Treasure Planet. The first thing to understand about this film is that it is not science fiction. This is science fantasy, in that it has technology in a world that does not have regard for science. Now, that's not a criticism, it's, it's just what it is. And the filmmakers make no apology for that. This is what they wanted, so everything you know about space should go out the window. Space is like a talking animal or breaking out into song. This is an aspect of the world that you're just going to have to accept. Pirates. And the most feared of all these pirates was the notorious Captain Nathaniel Flint. Well, that's not the picture of a guy with a future in dressmaking. As the pirate ship engages the other vessel, a little boy, Jim, watches it all as if it's just playing out in a storybook. Mom comes in to see is not sleeping like he's supposed to, but she's indulgent and lets him finish the story anyway. The pirates overcome the defenders, loot the ship, and then, as suddenly as they arrive, they leave, vanishing without a trace. Nice trick if you can pull it off. The treasure is still out there, too, the loot of a thousand worlds, on the unknown treasure planet. So grand the idea of such a place, combined with the fact that the pirates can come from nowhere and vanish into the ether, tells Mom it's just a legend. But we wouldn't be watching this movie if legends weren't real. Nobody watched Atlantis The Lost Empire to learn that it was just Plato's version of Independence Day and all they'd find was rocks and confused seahorses. Twelve years later, Jim is out having a grand old time doing his solar sail antics. This is someone who either thinks he can't die or secretly wants to die. It really could go either way. Oh man, it's the pigs! Back home, which is the Benbow Inn, Mom's busy serving everyone lunch, including Dr. Delbert Doppler, who, in keeping with his dignity, has his food and water in dog dishes. He politely inquires about Jim, who has been getting into trouble lately. And it hasn't been the good kind of trouble. It's the bring down the popo kind of trouble. Delbert tries to help, emphasis on tries, but the cop insists that with this violation of his probation, his craft is being impounded and one more screw up is going to send him to juvie. We see his type all the time, ma'am. Wrong choices, dead enders, losers. To serve and protect, but not big on building bridges with the community. His mom is worried, but Jim clearly hates his life here, and the fact that his father abandoned them is probably a big part of that. Jim overhears his mother's lamentation to Delbert about how he seems so smart, but... You're a slacker. Well, the tedium of his existence is interrupted by a crashing spaceship, and Billy Bones comes stumbling out, mortally wounded. He's on the run from a cyborg and his cutthroats, so Jim takes him into the inn, but the guy's wounds are beyond the skills of modern hoteling, and he perishes. But not before giving him something and warning about the cyborg. And sure enough, someone arrives, and looking kind of shady. Can't put my finger on why, though. The trio have to escape, but the inn is a lost cause. Place goes up in flames. Boy. If only Jim was riding his solar sail here, then at least the cops would have shown up. Over at Delbert's place, while he's comforting Mom about the loss of everything, Jim is looking over what old Billy Bones gave them, a sphere. When unlocked, the sphere creates a holographic space map, a map that shows the way to Treasure Planet. So we lost an inn, but we've gained a MacGuffin. Jim, naturally, is thinking about all that treasure, but Delbert is also interested. It would be the pinnacle of exploration to find the actual world where the most notorious pirate dumped his loot. So he intends to get a ship, captain, and crew for an expedition, and Jim can come along. It's his map, legally, under the case of Finders Keepers v. Losers Weepers. Mom's absolutely opposed to this. But Delbert points out that spending a few months on a supervised adventure might be what it takes to help Jim work through his problems. You know, 
build some character, maybe stop acting like a dick. This leads to a transition to what looks like a crescent moon, but it's actually a spaceport. Uh, take my word for it. In a zoom-in shot that shows how far the marriage of hand-drawn animation and computer software had really developed by this time. Technology has come a long way. Although sometimes a rising tide doesn't lift all boats. But soon they find their way to the ship, the RLS Legacy. Now with a name like that... Sorry about that, I didn't mean to... Dignity is what springs to mind. What a gas bag. They spot the captain running around the rigging to inspect the ship and try to catch that damn red dot that's sliding all over the place. That's Captain Amelia, and the big slab of granite is Mr. Arrow. And the mob of completely untrustworthy, shady-looking slit-your-throat-as-soon-as-look-at-you-hoodlums? That's the crew our lives will depend on. So, when Doppler mentions the treasure map, she quickly tells him to can it, and drags the pair downstairs so she can stow the map and then give him a seamanship lesson in shutting the hell up. A ludicrous parcel of driveling galoots, ma'am. There you go. Poetry. I refuse to accept that they're low quality. Why, I got them at the same place I bought this suit. Well, Jim has been quiet during all of this, but that doesn't mean he's going to get off the hook. He is to serve under the cook, Mr. Silver. Mr. Silver, of course, is the famous Long John Silver of both Treasure Island and a restaurant franchise. Much like the Burger King is also of a restaurant franchise and The King and I. Well, Jim takes one look and notes, a cyborg. And yes, of all the cyborgs it could be, it is indeed this cyborg that Billy Bones meant. Heavens to Betsy, what are the odds? Still, lunch looks pretty good, though. Old family recipe. By which I mean it's capable of looking, and pretty good at that. Is there anything around here that doesn't have eyes? That's Silver's little friend. Instead of a parrot, it's Morph. A flying, amorphous, shape-shifting critter. But he doesn't say pirate stuff, so that's one demerit. Silver learns that Jim is the cabin boy. Damn it. Don't give them a name or you'll get attached. Well, while he's trying to adjust to that situation, Jim decides, I'm going to see if Silver is the cyborg by questioning him. In a style that's like an 8 on the scale, where 0 is perfect subtlety and 10 is J'accuse! Oh yeah. Bones. Billy Bones? 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 I'm a doctor, not a mechanic. Silver sends him up so he can go watch the launch. I mean, the guy's not heartless. Okay, well, I mean, he might be heartless. We don't know the extent of his cybernetics, but he's probably not heartless. As you might have guessed by now, the running of the ship is precisely the same as if it was a naval sailing ship. It's just solar sails instead of regular ones. Watch. The way it is done, again, is beyond what could have been achieved with old-fashioned hand-drawn animation. And, of course, the background of the spaceport shows a busyness that you'd have had a hard time seeing in any other form before. In the next part, I'll get a bit more into what happened, I think, anyway, with Treasure Planet. But I close out this part saying it's kind of ironic that the symbol of what they can achieve with their animation in this film is a crescent moon given that this was the winner of the first Best Animated Film Oscar the year before, when the spiritually similar Disney film Atlantis didn't even get nominated. And Shrek wound up being added to the National Film Registry for being worthy of preservation. It's not the start and end of what happened, Shrek, but there's no denying the shadow that DreamWorks cast over Treasure Planet. But we'll get into that in the next part.